It's my nerd world and Depeche Mode, the podcast. On this week's episode, why Memento Mori and the tour is a success. Plus, we have some new Memento Mori track remixes, live sessions, listener feedback, and a fan spotlight. Hello, this is Martin Gore from Depeche Mode. Hi, this is Dave Garn from Depeche Mode, and you are listening to My Nerd Road. Welcome to it. I'm your host, John Justice. Glad you are with another episode this week as we talk all things my favorite band and yours, Depeche Mode here on Depeche Mode, the podcast. As always, if you want to communicate with the show, you can do that via email talkshownerd at gmail.com or leave a comment up on YouTube if you happen to be listening there. I want to um, point your direction towards another podcast that I recently produced. If you are a movie fan in general, I uh, recently put out on my Star Wars feed, uh, My Nerd World, a Star Wars show. Uh, It's a separate feed for My Nerd World, so you'd have to go back into your podcast platform or find it up on YouTube. But I uh, put out about a 30-minute podcast on how to save the modern blockbuster. It's an idea that I've been sitting on for quite a long time, and I'm a massive uh, film fan and a massive Star Wars fan, as you've probably heard and as I've talked about my Star Wars podcast in the past. But the cycle that we're in right now within pop culture and the effect that social networking, social media has in the public sphere and the creation of groupthink, Uh, in my opinion, does a massive disservice to the movie-going experience. And I've been sitting on this idea for a while of bringing back scarcity to the release of the modern blockbusters. And so I put out a podcast, if you're interested in hearing my ludicrous idea, go and check that out again on the My Nerd World, a Star Wars show feed. It was partly inspired by Depeche Mode, to be completely honest with you. I make this point in the podcast, so I don't want to completely ruin... Uh, and repeat myself if you happen to go and check the podcast out, which I hope that you will. But I think scarcity plays a lot in the success of of Depeche Mode. Uh, it helps when the content is good. It helps when the product itself is good. And I'll talk a bit more about that on this week's show. But going back and looking at the release dates of the earlier set of albums that came out leading up through and to right around ultra when the distance between the releases, you know, got further and further out. And certainly because of the pandemic, the six some odd years between the release of spirit and memento Mori, I think really has helped to capture this unique and special time that I've talked about on the show so much. Again, the product is really good and everything around the product is solid, but it also hit at right at the right time, and it's been a long time since we got new Depeche Mode music. So if you're interested in checking out my idea and my uh, my thoughts on how to save the modern blockbuster, I hope you will go and check out the podcast. Again, it's about 30 minutes uh, long. It's available up on my YouTube page of My Nerd World um, and, uh, of course, on the My Nerd World Star Wars feed. All right, so let's get into a couple of news items and then an article that I'm going to talk about but not really talk about, and I'll explain here in just a moment. Shortly after the release of last week's episode, uh, Depeche Mode officially released the uh, Anna remix for My Cosmos is Mine. I really like the remix. It almost gets there. I really thought it was going to go all the way, and it didn't. And what I mean by that is I know, and I've read a lot of the commentary on specifically the Halo forum um, about why the band releases the remixes that they do now and how these are the types of songs that get played in clubs and it helps with promotion. Um, I also know that I'm speaking for you as well that miss the days of the extended remixes, similar to the Memento Mori intro mix that I made for Ghosts Again, uh, which is available uh, on the Depeche Mode uh, podcast page at MyNerdWorld.net if you haven't checked it out. I basically took the snippet from My Cosmos is Mine from the press conference and then uh, combined it with the instrumental version of Ghosts Again and the single version to make sure to include all of the lyrics in it. It's one of the things that I really appreciated about the live version that the band now does consistently of um, A Pain That I'm Used To. That remix initially had all the lyrics in it. The Anna remix of My Cosmos is Mine 
almost gets there. It, it, it takes out a portion of the lyrics, and I really feel as if, or I really feel that if they had included all of the lyrics, in my opinion, then this would have been a remix that I would have been listening to certainly more so. I probably won't go back and revisit any of the Ghosts Again um, uh, uh, remixes, to be honest with you. I have listened to the My Cosmos Is Mine Anna remix quite a few times, but every time I'm going, oh, I wish we had all of the lyrics because it really has a vibe to it where if they made an edit, and I've been working on one, but I haven't been able to get it right where I want it. I've been trying to work on a radio edit of it. You could almost take that remix and apply it uh, to a live show, much in the same way they've done with a pain that I'm used to. That being said, after spending some time listening to the Anna remix of My Cosmos Is Mine, going back and listening to the album version, I suddenly had a new appreciation for it. And I do like that song, but when I went and listened to the album version, it just it was packing a punch. That's missing from the Anna remix. Not surprising. We're talking about a dance remix for the most part. Um, so again, it almost gets there. It just needed all the lyrics in my opinion. Also, the band released another Vinegar session of Wagging Tongue. Uh, they did the same thing for uh, Ghosts again um, shortly after the release of the album. It's good. It's really not all that far off from what we heard on the album version. A song which has grown on me quite a bit over the course of the past uh, few weeks. Uh, reminds me a lot of the sort of studio versions that they did on the documentaries for Sounds of the Universe. Um, I really appreciate it and like those. So uh, it was nice to see another um, Vinegar session and another sort of live rendering of Wagging Tongue. Doesn't really offer m anything new to the song, uh, but still, I mean, any any sort of live performance of something official off the album, I'll uh, I'll take. All right, let's go to this. I found this article when I was looking for content for this week's show. Got a lot of listener feedback to get to. But I was looking for content. I stumbled across this article. I wanted to talk about it, but then not talk about it. Let me explain. So the article comes from Pop Matters. Never heard of this um, website uh, before. The title is Retro Futurism. How the alt-right learned to love Depeche Mode. Like, okay, I want to get into, and this kind of inspired me to get into why Memento Mori has been such a success. And it leans into a bit of what I mentioned in terms of scarcity in the podcast I did. But this article um, has a subheadline for Richard Spencer and today's alt-right 80s British synth pop bands like Depeche Mode satisfy their retro futurist cultural fantasies. I'm like, okay, what is this about? I was curious uh, mostly because I host a news talk show as my full-time job Monday through Friday. Alt-right is not a term that I've heard used nearly as much as it was a handful of years ago. Of course, Richard Spencer came to prominence a while back because of his um, statement talking about Depeche Mode being um, you know, an alt-right band or something like of this. I think that's what it was, and it was ridiculous when I heard it. So let me share with you just the opening paragraph and then tell you why I wanted to bring it up and how I'm not going to bring it up. So the article goes as follows. This is just the opening paragraph. Richard B. Spencer, president of the National Policy Institute think tank, does not look like your stereotypical right-wing extremist with his slicked-backed hair, long on top, buzzed on the sides, and suave suits. The man who coined the term alt-right in 2008 appears more like a corporate executive or a model from GQ. Yet... We have seen this look before in another time and place. Did not Adolf Hitler wear expensive tailored suits and his hair greased back and cropped too? Did not that image of satorial superiority inform his minions who's the boss? Within the world of pop music, this look also had its time in the spotlight during the 1980s when the new romantic subculture wore variations on this sophisticated, attention-demanding attire. Now, this is a rather lengthy piece. Talks a bit about Depeche Mode, but also talks about a lot of the new romantic bands from that time period, uh, Duran Duran being, being one of them. I am not going there, okay? Don't like Richard Spencer. That's an easy thing to say. Um, it's, it's, prob it's probably like the least way to say that right. Um, certainly understood why people were thought it was ridiculous when he made his comments about Depeche Mode. 
uh, whenever he went and made those comments. Of course, the band responded to it. I'm not turning this into politics at all and not going there. Because this is not where Depeche Mode takes me. And this is the point that I wanted to make. Okay, I don't care who likes Depeche Mode. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. And I don't think Depeche Mode really, um, really has any specific demographic that they point to. I think that's part of what's so great about the, the band. I don't believe that it's this aspect of the band in any way, shape, or form as to why it brings so many people together. Um, maybe some people do. I, I personally don't. In a sense, I love Depeche Mode in the same way that I love Star Wars. It's It, it transcends. Star Wars was a cultural touchstone that brought people together um, and then continued to bring families together through its popularity throughout the years. My father went to go take me to see it when I was five years old. And, you know, as I grew up and spent more time watching the films with my dad, I now carry that on to my kids. At the time when I discovered Depeche Mode back in 1985, it spoke to me and it spoke to a lot of people and continues to speak to generations through its lyrical themes it's ambiguity, which is, I think, why you have so many people from different avenues of life, even avenues of life that I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, do not <laughs> adhere to, right? Um, but it's musical composition and the connection and the lyrical themes is what we can all relate to, right? So... Again, that's my way of mentioning that article. I I, I don't suggest going out. If, if you're interested in, in the read, it's an interesting read. Um, uh, it mentions our favorite band. But again, that's kind of where I stopped and started as I perused through it because I don't believe that it's anything about the political aspect of the band at all that is what unites us. It's one of the things that I love about Depeche Mode is that people from all walks of, of life enjoy this band and it's still a public space where we can come together regardless of um you know our our views beyond beyond the band depeche mode fans are good people regardless of of uh of our different ideologies right one thing that i wanted that that kind of made me think about this as well is getting into why depeche mode and memento mori in this time period has been so successful i've been kind of jealous watching the Twitter feeds of Depeche Mode fans and they're going to concerts in Europe and Twickenham recently and watching Vaughn on YouTube and his review of that particular show, reading the amazing reviews from the recent performances that they've had. Um, friends that I've made that I've known in the past, Rob Rome from the Global Depeche Fan Club, um, following the band to certain locations where he could uh, my friend Jeff that I've met as well has been to several shows and it it makes me wish that I could be traveling to more shows like I did when I was younger when I had the time to go and do such things and life didn't get in the way I feel blessed as it is to be able to go with my friend Matt in uh, November and I cannot wait to see the uh, to see the show but it's a feeling of of excitement that I've mentioned so many times on the show that it just it hasn't been there for me at least for a long, uh, long time. But one of the reasons why Memento Mori has been such a huge success is it's a great album. There's a scarcity aspect of it that I mentioned before, but if the album didn't deliver, I don't think that we would be talking about it or I would be doing weekly podcasts um, like I have been. Um, I said I've said from the start, from when I first got the leaked uh, the leaked copy of the album, that um, it's almost a compilation in a way, a tribute to their vast catalog of work, especially in its nods to previous songs. The I feel you esque squeal in People Are Good, the simplicity of the lyrics themselves in People Are Good. Listen to People Are People and People Are Good back to back. That is a fun experience. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. The emotional depth of Don't Say You Love Me that echoes, in my opinion, a song like In Your Room or It Doesn't Matter from Some Great Reward. Um, the throb of Never Let Me Go, reminiscent of Lillian, So Much Love But Better. In Your Memory. The singing of Sometimes in Caroline's Monkey that sounds like it was taken right from Clean. Um, but it also struck at a right time when I think we all needed our friends again, whether it's each other or whether it's the guys in the band. Certainly as we 
um, still mourn the loss of, of Fletch and the, the gravity of losing one of the founding members of the band. It also landed at the right moment, and that is certainly the case with the tour. I think at this moment in time, for one of the first times, I think, for most for the most part, collectively, we all feel comfortable going outside again together in the wake of the pandemic. The entire production of the tour down to the album itself and the artwork, apart from sort of the bizarre single and remix releases, um, everything for the first time, really, in my opinion, since Ultra just works and has created this unique moment in time that really has recaptured the way it was when Depeche Mode was a all of my life in that moment in time during the release of Music for the Masses being 15 years old and then sort of growing up with Violator and Songs of Faith and Devotion and then, you know, into adulthood with Ultra and, and onward. I created a playlist of older tracks with Memento Mori. I went back and grabbed a lot of... Um, a lot of more upbeat tracks back from the uh, from the 80s. Told You So, Master and Servant, People Are People I Mentioned, uh, Shout, In Your Memory. Um, and I sort of I took a playlist and mixed them up with the songs from the entire album of, of Memento Mori. And it's a really fun juxtaposition to hear those older tracks mixed in with the most recent songs. I came to the conclusion the band has really given itself a hard time. I know songs like Strange Love to a lesser extent. They've played that live um, uh, recently. But, you know, you we haven't seen, you know, People Are People live since the 101 show. The band has constantly derided its call to heart. I don't think those songs get enough credit. It's actually a credit to the band that they can nail, and certainly Martin Gore can nail the simplicity of the lyrics of some of those songs. I mean, you listen to People Are Good, and it doesn't have any more depth than People Are People does, but it works. Any more than It's Called a Heart has any more depth than People Are People does, but it works. But they follow those up with emotional depth, with rhythmic ambiguity and lyrical stylings that rank with some of the greatest songs ever written. I think this is a further testament to how special this band is. And again, why Memento Mori itself is such a great album, because it really flows together as a whole very well, even though there is quite the range of styling in the songs and the lyrical content in and of itself. Like if you had taken the lyrics from People Are Good and put that next to the lyrics of, well, you can go Wagging Tongue or Ghosts Again or Don't Say You Love Me. And I think you would be hard-pressed to go that those are from the same album. I could be completely off. That's just my opinion on it. But the album flows together really well despite all of that and the different range in beats and stylings of the of the songs. Many people have mentioned this, and I've said it from the start. The album works very well together is in all respects, Depeche Mode, while being something wholly different and at the same time drawing from the great things that they've done in the past. All of it just absolutely 100% works right out to them going out, out on tour. And you know what? It makes me appreciate the playlist, even though I haven't seen the show live yet. It makes me appreciate the set list a little bit more than I did before having you know, put together the, the commentary for the podcast this week and looking at it through those lens. From what I've seen of the live show and watching the Primavera live stream, which, by the way, somebody had messaged me, and it might be in the um, listener feedback that I'm going to share with you in just a moment, that the reason why the camera work got so wonky is they were pulling it directly from the side screens, and so the effects were being done for the crowd, not for the people at home. So that could have been it. And again, I think it's in one of the, uh, it's in the listener feedback. But the songs flow together great live. And while I would love to see a show that had all the Memento Mori tracks, I can appreciate the way the band has crafted this set list in much the same fashion that I went and created a new set list interspersing old songs uh, with the new album. Talkshownerd at gmail.com uh, is the email address if you want to call me crazy. <laughs> you can also leave a comment up on uh, YouTube as well. All right, let's hear from you. Uh, first, we hear from um, Georg. I'm going to go with Georg. If I'm saying that wrong, from uh, around Hamburg in Germany, I apologize. 
Uh, hi, John. I am Georg from around Hamburg in Germany, and this is the first time I write to you. I like your podcast about Depeche Mode. Thank you for that. Thank you for writing. I follow DM since everything counts. My first gig was Black Celebration in 86 in Hanover. Since then, I went to every tour at least once. The devotional tour for me is the best tour ever. I saw that at least 10 times. The last concerts were the two final gigs in Berlin. The albums released after Ultra, which is great, I do not like so much. For my opinion, it got worse with every album released since then. Memento Mori, however, is pretty great again. I didn't expect DM to become that great again. Still, I think they could have made more of one other track, one or two minutes of some tracks that would have been great. Ghosts, again, for me, is too clean. Great track, but it kind of does not hurt at all. However, on this Memento Mori tour, I will not attend any gig as I support my girlfriend who suffers from cancer. Oh, that's horrible to hear. Um, she makes the Gerson therapy. I guess it is quite famous in the States. Uh, more than here in Europe, in Germany anyways. This therapy costs a lot of money and time. Therefore, I do not have the money to go. Um, it is not because DM have Christian Iger on board for the tours, and I think he does not suit the live performance of an electronic band like DM, but that is a different issue, maybe for another email. But uh, for the reason I'm writing, uh, for, for the reason I'm writing is your thoughts about "Never Let Me Go." I like the idea that the track is d directed to the fans, especially if it will be played at the end of a gig. That would make sense. But then again, I ask myself, well, would Martin really think that about the fans while writing a song? Martin once said in an interview, "You people think too much." This goes very much for your idea as well. Sorry to say that. And then I got a winky face. Totally fine. Yeah, again, that was a, just a thought I had for Never Let Me Go. Clearly, the song is about a relationship. I understand that. That song has also grown on me quite a bit. I've been listening to that one constantly. You're welcome, Matt. Um, and so I don't take offense to that at all. Uh, very often when I do a preparation for the juices and cooking the meals or whatever, um, for the justice, I listen to your podcast. So no problem if they are long. Great to hear. Um, hold on. My screen just freaked out on me. All right. There we go. I fixed it. Oh, and thanks for the tip of the smart list podcast. Not many news on DM, but still an entertaining listen. Take care and enjoy DM any way you prefer. Creative regards, Georg. Thank you very much for uh, the uh, email. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, now we go to uh, Amy in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. I got to thinking about the podcast you did a few months ago and what people wear to a Depeche Mode show. And I wanted to share my experience when I went to see Duran Duran in Atlanta last Thursday. They were the first band, a uh, love slash love, back in the early 80s. So, of course, I had to be there. First of all, it was such a good show. So much fun. But Simon LeBon was never my favorite guy. And his ugly comments to Dave that one time really didn't help his cause as far as I'm concerned. I'm not sure if I'm familiar with those comments. And I'm not sure I want to know. I can't remember exactly what Dave said, Simon said to him, but I do remember it was very dismissive. But you can't have a Duran Duran without Mr. LeBon. So in solidarity with Depeche, I channeled my inner Dave, Circa Music for the Masses, and Violator, and wore my white jeans, black T-shirt, and metal-studded black belt, and did my best Dave ass shakes and Martin awkward finger pointing just for good measure. <clears throat> the DM show is more sophisticated and modern as far as their stage presence, lighting aesthetic goes. Duran Duran's lights and graphics seem to me a bit dated and grainy, but that might have been on purpose, the whole throwback to the 80s retro vibe they play into. But admittedly, I've only seen that one show on this tour, and I had a few drinks. Another thing, I was pleasantly surprised about how many people were wearing tour shirts from all kinds of bands. Now, mostly these were Gen Xers. They were really, uh, reliving their youth. But I enjoyed seeing the different <clears throat> tour shirts from Def Leppard to Black Sabbath to the recent Cruel, Cruel World Festival where Susie played last month. Behind me sat the only Depeche Mode shirt I saw that night. It was a Delta Machine tour shirt. Of course, I had to talk to this guy and give him a, my hearty approval of his shirt and show him my shirtless, sweaty Dave pic that's on my lock screen on my phone so that he'd know I was in solidarity with him. As he got there a bit late, I didn't have much chance to talk his ear off about DM. Probably a good thing for this guy, she writes. 
But I did tell him that I was representing the mode that night as well as just in my own subversive way. Anyways, I wanted to touch base, let my fellow devotees know that we are well represented in Atlanta last Thursday. Until next time, stay frosty. Amy in, uh, oh, I scrolled forward, in Birmingham, Alabama. That's what I thought. Thank you, Amy. Always appreciate your tales. All right, let's uh, hear from uh, Torsten from South Germany. Um, First of all, thank you for reading my mail in March on your show. One of the highlights in this fabulous DM season. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, Your podcast is a much listen for me in the meantime. Apropos highlights, finally, the long wait has an end since I will be attending the upcoming Munich and Second Frankfurt shows. I am so happy that I will probably enjoy both set lists. Home, speak to me, and waiting for the night condemnation are strong pairs, and to get them all performed would slash will be great. By the way, I listened to the newly released Anna remix of My Cosmos is Mine, and like the Ghost Again remixes, it doesn't set me on fire, although I mainly listen to techno music. But the original tracks are so strong, maybe I just don't want to like their reinterpretations. And last, to my understanding of the comments from the German fan page, the footage, oh, here we go, from the Primavera Festival was the footage from the stage screens, and this explains the blackouts and the video effects. Look forward to many new episodes. Wish you all the best. Uh, Torsten from South Germany. Yeah, so there you go. That's what, that's, uh, he was the one who shared that with me. Violator90 writes, and thank you for that, Torsten. Uh, Thanks for the upload. I really enjoy and appreciate your love and dedication for the best band of all time. For me, Memento Mori is up there with the top DM albums. I've listened to it on repeat since it was available. I listen to it at least once a day now. There is something special with Memento Mori. The atmosphere, the sounds, and the vocals are amazing. It's a very different and mature album with a lot of depth. I really have a hard time for those who think Memento Mori is a meh album with no atmosphere or good songs except for Ghost Again. I don't get it at all. Do we really listen to the same album, he says, with a laughing face? Personally, Memento Mori is up there with songs of faith and devotion and ultra. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Violator90. I will, as long as they keep paying me. Ha, ha, ha. All right. Uh, Let's see. Chad, a friend of the show, Chad writes, "Um, I wasn't really expecting physical singles. But I am really confused at what they're doing with the official album singles being digital. Seems only Ghosts again with the digital single, video, and remixes. Again, to my surprise and confusion, uh, today I see the My Cosmos is Mine Anna remix released. Just one mix. Not bad, but nothing amazing either. I guess Martin likes Anna's stuff since she mixed a chimpanzee song for him. I'll take it. Happy it's out there, but still confused what's happening. I'm hoping still for uh, people are good and never let me go, Chad. Yeah, me too. Man, people are good. That's such such an absolutely fantastic song. Why we have not gotten that live or remixes of that, I just don't understand. Friend of the show, Stephanie, writes, As you know, I'm a little younger than most Depeche Mode fans. I was born in 82 when I discovered Depeche Mode. I was a high school student and had plenty of time to catch up on all the albums I had missed. I remember endless hours on the terrace with a new book and Depeche Mode in the Disc Man. If there was or is no new album in sight, I went to Depeche Mode parties, read biographies or newspapers, articles, or watched reports, concert movies, etc. about my favorites. I also put out feelers to Yahoo or Erasure because, as we all know, one member is Vince Clark, a former, albeit brief, member of DM in 2005. I really liked their album Nightbird. I also enjoy talking to other fans about DM and thanks to social media. That's it for me today. I hope you're having a great summer. I'm looking forward to the 7-7 show in Berlin. That's the day before my birthday. Unbelievable. It's really not that long away. I remember buying tickets in October with tears in my eyes after my girlfriend agreed to watch my six-year-old son. All the best from the Baltic Coast, Stephanie. Thank you, as always, Stephanie. It's great to hear from you. All right. Philip Finch from Leeds in the UK writes, After a wait of six years, I finally got to see Depeche Mode live again at their show at Twickenham Stadium in London on Saturday, June 17th. Uh, Here are the headlines. The show was absolutely amazing. The band are on amazing form and evidently hugely enjoying themselves. I was astounded at the power and range of Dave's voice, one minute pounding out the almost machine gun-like lyrics of Wrong, the next gentle and beautiful in harmony 
with Martin on Waiting for the Night to Fall. Martin, by the way, was on atmos- an almost operatic form, A Question of Lust and Soul with Me, were utterly amazing. And Dave came on stage to get Martin to sing the chorus of Soul with Me again as he loved it so much. The sound was great, especially the drum sound. It feels more machine-like, an example of being on stripped, which sounded, um, an example being on stripped, which sounded uh, much more like the 101 program loud, crisp drum sound. If you watch Christian, he is delivering that performance live. It just sounds much, much better. The structure of the show is perfect. On the Spirit Tour, there seemed to be a lower impact in the first half of the show with lots of deeper cuts and piano versions in the first hour before the hits lifted things in the last part. This time around, it was much more consistent in a powerful journey all along the way, bringing Everything Counts forward to sing uh, five and six in, in the running order was a stroke of genius. Also, I've changed my mind about them performing wrong in John the Revelator. These two tracks rocked along with the pain that I'm used to. These were clever track placings showcasing the post-classic phase songs and blowing away the audience. Brilliant. All in all, a truly superb show and potentially the strongest set performance I've seen in 33 years. Are these guys really 61? They perform like they're 31. Enjoying uh, getting to see them again. Thanks for the podcast, Philip. Great review, uh, Philip. Um, and uh, if I couldn't be more excited, that's getting me uh, more excited as well. All right, uh, let's get to a listener feedback this week before I wrap up the show. And as I've mentioned several times, I've been holding on to quite a few of these, so if you haven't heard me read your stories, I will be getting to them eventually, like I am with Ricardo from Riverside, California, my old neck of the woods. I found your podcast while searching for information, In preparation for the release of Ghosts Again and Memento Mori, I really enjoy your content and commentary on all things Depeche Mode. I was a high school sophomore in 1988 when Depeche Mode first caught my attention. I remember sitting in my school theater watching a French club student fashion show when I first heard Never Let Me Down Again, the aggro mix as students walked down the hallway. My attention shifted from the clothes my classmates were modeling to the sounds that were coming out of the old speakers, and I was instantly intrigued. I did not know who Depeche Mode was or what the song was called, but the beats of that mix played in my head for a while after that night. A few weeks later, a friend offered me a cassette tape he had on him in lieu of some money he owed me, and I took it. The cassette was music for the masses, and my life was changed forever. I then embarked on a journey to discover DM's earlier works and began identifying other tracks that I had heard before, like I Just Can't Get Enough, People Are People, and Black Celebration, which also blew my mind. Since that day in 1988, I have been one of their biggest fans, and I've waited for every new album with anticipation, just as I did for Memento Mori. My first tour was the World Violation Tour, And I've had the privilege of attending every tour after that. My closest encounter with a member of the band was in 2009 when they performed on the streets of Hollywood as part of the Jimmy Kimmel Live series. After the show, I decided to avoid some traffic by sticking around to watch some of the teardown. After about 15 minutes, I saw Martin walking towards me. I could have asked him for a picture or an autograph, but instead the only words that came out of my mouth were, I love you, Martin. I think what I meant to say was, I love your work. And thank you for your music all these years. But I was starstruck and frozen. He looked at me confused, half smiled, and kept walking. My family still gets a good laugh when I recount that story. I could spend hours talking about the place marks that each DM song and albums created in my life. I think we all could, Richard. But it would make for a very long email. Thank you for the podcast and keep it going. Uh, Again, Richard from Riverside, California. And thank you, Richard, for being the uh, fan spotlight this week. I greatly appreciate it. And that wraps up the show. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did recording it. And as always, if you want to support my nerd world and the Depeche Mode podcast and you like to read or you know somebody who likes to read... I hope you will check out my science fiction space opera series, Embark, which includes plenty of nods to yours and my favorite band, Depeche Mode. And if you like your science fiction to be epic, filled with some romance and action, Embark is perfect for you. It's written for adults, but great for ages 11 plus. Don't have to worry about any content that you wouldn't find appropriate. Think Star Wars in terms of the content. 
You can pick up the entire seven book series in ebook, hardcover, paperback, and audiobook on Amazon.com or MyNerdWorld.net. It's where you can follow a ragtag squadron of pilots and one reluctant hero on a journey of survival to the far reaches of space as they fight for humanity's future among the stars. Their cosmos is theirs. All right, that was cheesy, I know, but I did it anyways. <laughs> MyNerdWorld.net or Amazon.com. Uh, Look for John J.O. and Justice and Embark and pick up your preferred copy. All right. I hope wherever you are, you're happy, you're healthy, you're safe, you're enjoying yourself some Depeche Mode, and I'll talk to you again next week. Bye. Hello, this is Martin Shaw. Hello, hi, this is Dave Gold.